New data on teens and mental health tells a pretty alarming story. According to the CDC and the state of Minnesota, there are more children who are depressed, anxious, and even suicidal than ever before. This new data doesn't look at the last couple of years. It shows mental health problems started surging before the pandemic. COVID just sent it through the roof. In the first of a two-part series, Amy Hockert pulls back the curtain on mental health support in Minnesota's public schools and finds in most cases it's broken at best. In every district in Minnesota, school psychologists like Miranda Bernier are on the front lines of your child's mental health. Recently, we asked Miranda, school psychologist Damian Smith, and psychologist and researcher Daniel Kanawitz to help us pull back the curtain on mental health in our schools. When I think about um, kids and mental health, I think of it as the, the great problem, the problem that needs to be solved before we can really address anything else. Um, kids going through mental health crisis are unable to learn. I think that it is nothing short of a crisis and needs to be understood as a crisis. Um, we need to take sweeping intensive action to address this within our schools. Then we ask them, what does this mental health crisis look like day to day? Students that are struggling are quite literally shouting in school for help, like getting in fights, bringing weapons. They're shouting at the adults in their lives saying, I need help and they're not getting listened to and then so they ramp up the behavior. And then there are those who struggle quietly. They withdraw, fall behind in class, or worse. Here's the crisis by the numbers. Every three years, the state gives Minnesota 8th, 9th, and 11th graders a voluntary survey about mental health. We took a look at the 2022 results released in December. Just over 100,000 students responded. On average, in a class of 35 students, 10 are struggling with a long-term mental health problem. Eight have harmed themselves anywhere from one to 20 or more times in the last year. About five have seriously considered suicide in the last year. Statistically, one and a half will have attempted to take their own life. The data also shows teen girls are suffering disproportionately. On average, nearly one in three said they've harmed themselves in the last year and one in five has attempted suicide in that time. All told, we're talking about tens of thousands of junior high and high school students who are in desperate need of help. The mental health crisis that we're going through has touched all of our kids. So it's a good thing our schools are among the best in the country and they're prepared to navigate this mental health crisis, right? Having been an educator who worked um, in other states prior to coming to Minnesota. I have to share that my experience in Minnesota is that we are uniquely ill-equipped. Uniquely ill-equipped. How could that be? For starters, the ratio of Minnesota public school counselors and psychologists to students is alarming. It is the third worst in the country. For school, for counselors, the, the recommended ratio is 1 to 250. The national average is 1 to 424, and the, the Minnesota ratio is 1 to 650. Um, for school psychologists, the recommended ratio is 1 to 500, and the actual ratio is 1 to 1,127. Really long wait lists and not having the resources to give to our students. Often if we have a student coming in and we want to give them service, there's usually, you know, 30 or 40 kids before them. And the few psychologists and counselors who are in schools are drowning in work that has less to do with students' mental health. School psychologists are resigned often to one aspect of their role, which is testing to determine eligibility for special education services. So Minnesota has a great um, education system as far as uh, testing scores for students who have access to resources, who are already privileged enough to be able to navigate the system successfully. The problem is we also have the greatest disparities in the country because we have so many students who aren't able to access those resources and who aren't able to navigate that system. You may be surprised to learn that the overwhelming majority of psychologists' time isn't spent directly on mental health services. It's spent on developing and maintaining learning plans for students with special education needs. And that's because Minnesota has one of the highest special ed eligibility rates in the country. Nearly one in five students qualifies for help. When I was an intern, I had upwards of 10 buildings that I was serving. 
So in one year, I did almost 160 special education evaluations, which is just like unbelievable. If you think that each one takes about 10 to 15 hours. There's so much more. For, for um, giving IQ tests, giving achievement testing, any of that, that was one class that I took oh my of my three years of yeah. in-class study. There's so many more things that we, that we know how to do that we just, if we had the numbers, we could do it. The solution sounds straightforward. Add counselors and psychologists. But the reality is that could take years and money, lots of money. And so um, how do we start to work towards solutions? At a legislative level, um, funding is a word that comes up. I think a lot of people have skepticism when they hear just funding, just throw money at an issue. We're talking about funding specifically for a greater workforce of student support personnel, and that's school psychologists, social workers, counselors, and nurses. We need to address the mental and physical health of our students in a much more profound way. Well, there is a mental health bill that is making its way through the legislature right now through the House, and it would give money to schools to create more support staff and help bolster the pipeline for more school psychologists in the future. And we're told there's a lot of optimism around this bill that it will pass this session. But again, it's not a quick fix. Schools have to receive the money and then find the staff. So we are probably talking about Kelsey and Randy years mm. before we see this come to fruition. But I know, Kelsey, you've done some stories on a program here locally called Reach that is doing some great work as it, well. In Hutchinson, in the high school and the middle right. school, they've been doing this for years where they have a social worker and a counselor teach a class during the school day. And it's not really a class. They help with homework. They help with life. And 40 other schools across the state and schools in other states have adopted this program as well. And again, it, it's taught by counselors and social workers. And it's part of the school day. So mm -hmm. I think they are, I think they've talked with the legislature mm -hmm. as well, um, trying to get some attention for what they're doing yeah. out there. And you bring up a great point about being in school and they, these psychologists we talk to talk about these wraparound services. When it's in the school, it doesn't matter if you have insurance or not. It doesn't matter. Right. You can get a bus to go there and it just really wipes out so many of the obstacles that you would face outside of school, waiting lists, things like that. So yeah. I'm hoping that these programs start to take hold. Um, tomorrow in part two, we actually talk to some kids uh, and, and parents and we find out how they're sort of patching together their own solutions right now while we wait for some of these things to play out in the legislature. I advocate for it as much as I can because it affects so many people to affect me. So we talked to these kids, uh, some dealing with depression in the past, presently, um, have even attempted suicide. And they show us how kids are supporting other kids who are struggling. And they also have some great advice uh, for adults in their lives, what we can do to support them. And the answer, in most cases, they say, is not <laughs> fix it. That is not what they want in that moment. So mm. important to know what they need. I'm just curious if any of those experts said anything about the whys. You, you talk about this surge in, in mental health issues with, with young people, but has anybody tried to figure out exactly what's going on and why such volumes of this? Yeah, we do have actually an extended cut of these interviews, about 20 minutes worth on our website and on our YouTube page. And they do, they talk about it. It's, it's all of the things you can imagine, right? COVID, even though it was happening before COVID, it really surged during and after. Social media is another thing. Kids are in more, they're, in better touch with their feelings nowadays. They feel more comfortable talking about it, which is great, but they're also more aware. Yeah. And so, you know, they, it, it's just becoming more of an uh, awareness and more of a problem for them. Um, and they, you know, they're, they're doing their best to get there. And the schools are doing their best too. We want to point that out. They really are doing their best with the very scarce resources that they're they have. They're asking for more resources every time they have a contract yeah. negotiation, Yes, for and they have been making some progress in, in the recent year, but um, they're hoping the legislature can really put them over the goal line to really make a tangible difference. Each new generation faces new challenges, Absolutely. and then we have to react to try to solve the some of one. those issues. And so one. these kids are growing up in a way that we did not. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Amy. You bet. Well,